The Lord be with you. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you here this morning. Have you ever been in a room full of people when somebody tells a story and everybody laughs and you don't get it? <laughs> but you laugh, but you don't get it. Um, that happens to us all through life, different things, doesn't it? Things that we don't get. And it happens to Jesus' disciples this morning. And uh, we're going to talk about that. It's interesting. Uh, it's a great lesson and an interesting story to talk about. So God bless us as we do that. Why don't we rise for our opening hymn. Hallelujah, let praises ring as we continue our, our uh, season of Easter.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For His name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the heaven and earth. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The dwelling of God is with his people. Jesus is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. Therefore, by your faith in our risen Savior, all your sins have been forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we listen to God's word for this morning. For the uh, fifth Sunday after Easter, uh, our Old Testament reading comes to us from Acts 11, starting the first verse. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in, or to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa. Praying in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent, which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man, man's house. And he told us how he had, been an, had seen an angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. 
Our epistle reading comes from Revelation, verse, uh, starting at, uh, Revelation 21, starting at the first verse. When he saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated at the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Please rise for our gospel reading. The Holy Gospel this morning comes to us from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, beginning at verse 12. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them, bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. And so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she ha no longer remembers the anguish for joy that the human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated.
to you. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I started reading a book this week that was written for baby boomers. It's called Things I Don't Get, Which Are a Lot, by Lawrence Perkins. In the foreword, the author says that getting old reminds him of the line from the song My Generation by The Who. I hope I die before I get old. He says, now I know what they meant about thinking and acting like an older person. In fact, he says, if you don't know who Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend are, you're way too young to be interested in this book. The rest of it is a collection of thoughts and observations on just how many things have changed since he was a kid. Like nurturing parents repeating those words of wisdom, clean your plate, there are children starving in China. Now, that was a favorite around my house growing up, but it never fooled me. In fact, I could never understand the connection between the two. In all the times I didn't clean my plate completely, I never once saw someone stop by to collect and then airlift those scraps to those poor Chinese kids on the other side of the world. I had my own suspicions about where they ended up and it was a lot closer than China. I can totally relate to this one. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they'll get stuck like that. Now well, that one was pretty effective and it still haunts me today. The author once asked his optometrist to verify that was true. He says, well, the doc hesitated and then answered, probably not. Smart guy. He didn't exactly contradict the parents, but left plenty of room for doubt. Anyway, the book brings back lots of memories, and if you're age appropriate for it, you, you probably enjoy the humorous walk down memory lane. We do have more time to uh, think about things as we get older, though, or we take more time, maybe. Things we just can't understand, but never really stopped to question before. Uh, like, you know, where in the nursery rhyme does it say that Humpty Dumpty was an egg? It doesn't. Not until chapter six of Lewis Carroll's 1872 novel, Through the Looking Glass, when Alice comes across him sitting atop a wall. In fact, he's the one that introduces her to the concept of unbirthdays, which are much better than having only one birthday to celebrate. If you have time to dig deep, you'll discover that the original Humpty Dumpty wasn't an egg at all, but the nickname of a very large cannon believed to have been used in the English Civil War, particularly in the siege of Colchester in 1648. While the town was under siege, one of the cannons from the attacking side managed to destroy the wall that Humpty Dumpty was positioned on. Hence, Humpty Dumpty came tumbling down and all the king's men were unable to put him back together again. Some of you had lots more time to think about some of these things than I have. And so you probably already wondered, when you catch a fish and release it, does he tell his friends that he was abducted by aliens? Or instead of just asking the question, why do people say, can I ask you a question? It makes you want to say, I think you just did. <laughs> have you ever stopped to think about how television ever got so explicit? Who let that happen? Well, I guess the audience had a lot to do with it by simply watching. Or how in the world a simple pair of glasses had the power to make Superman unrecognizable as Clark Kent, even to Lois Lane? Or how could it be that audiences who, audiences who could repeat the opening lines of that television show and still can, you know, look up in the sky, couldn't tell the difference between a bird and a plane and a flying man in a cape? I never questioned it. I just enjoyed watching it. Anyway, simpler times, I guess. But in every time, there have been things we just don't get. Look at our lesson this morning. Maybe you caught it. Jesus is with his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And he tells them, a little while you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me. You'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. And the disciples look at each other and ask in effect, huh? <laughs> On the scale of important information to know, this one's right up there. It makes staying out of the water for an hour after you eat so you won't drown hardly seem worth mentioning. We know that Jesus talked a lot in parables and that sometimes he would have to take his disciples aside afterward and explain one to them, but uh, he didn't usually talk in riddles. Uh, so what's going on? Again, it'll help to put the lesson into context. The conversation took place on Monday, Thursday, the night of his arrest. The next morning, he would be nailed to a cross. And what he really meant was, I'll be with you for the next four or five hours, a little while. But after that, they'll come for me. 
led by Judas, my betrayer. I'll suffer through a trial and beatings and even torture. Tomorrow morning, I'll be brought before the governor, Pontius Pilate, and he won't find anything really, uh, won't find me guilty of anything deserving death. But in spite of that, he's going to cave into the political pressure of my enemies and order my crucifixion. And then for a little while, for three days, you will mourn like you'll never see me again. You'll remember the three years we spent together, the hope you had, the good things we accomplished together. And then suddenly left on your own, the, the loss will be devastating. On the third day, I'll rise from the dead. The stone will be rolled away from the tomb where you have laid, will have laid my body and you'll see me again. Your sorrow will be turned to rejoicing. Now as John writes about this after the fact, looking back on that night, you get the feeling that maybe he finally understood that Jesus wanted them to grasp the enormity of his death and resurrection. The way his sacrifice would affect not only them, but all people down through the ages. But at the time, the disciples didn't know any of this. They'll ask each other, what is this he says to us a little while and you will not see me? What does he mean by a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. Why was he leaving them? Um, was he even coming back and when? Would they ever really see him again? You know, how could his going away ever result in them rejoicing? They didn't get it. And they were too embarrassed to tell him that they didn't get it. Now Jesus knew that in just 40 days after Easter, he would, he would return to his father to take his place at God's right hand. He knew that the trials that lay before these men, his closest friends, uh, uh, the, the tragedy, he knew those things. He, he knew the suffering and finally the death for their association with him uh, and their faith in him. According to the Bible, the church's very first martyr was a deacon named Stephen who was stoned to death for his faith. And in the years and decades that followed Jesus' ascension, as the good news spread and the church grew, many names would be added to that list. According to tradition, every one of Jesus' disciples, with the exception of John, was killed for their faith, beheaded, crucified, stoned, stabbed, or even hanged. Tradition doesn't agree on the method, but they all agree that they were martyred, that they paid the ultimate price. The single exception, John, the disciple who Jesus uh, commended to the care of his mother Mary to from the cross, lived to a ripe old age in exile on the island of Patmos. And it was there the apostle received his, his visions found in the book of Revelation. Something else they didn't get was Jesus mentioned that he was going to the Father. Think about all that's packed into that little phrase. When Jesus talked about going to or coming from the Father, it was his way of saying that he was the true Son of God from eternity, that he became true man and revealed himself on earth in human form. That is true God, he humbled himself uh, to step down from his throne in heaven and be born into the flesh. That he allowed himself to be seen and heard that he ate and drank and slept and worked and taught and ministered and that he suffered and according to his human nature, he died just like any other human being. That he was going to the Father meant that through his resurrection from the dead, he would return to his place in heaven at the right hand of God reigning with him forever as our eternal omnipotent God, filling the earth with his presence. You know, this was way beyond the disciples' ability to understand at that point. They knew the man Jesus. They'd seen the power of God working through him as he healed the sick and walked on water and turned water into wine and multiplied a small boy's lunch into enough food to feed a multitude. So many other things. The disciples were drawn to him. They believed in him even forfeiting their lives rather than give up their faith in him. But on this Monday, Thursday, there was just no way they were going to get it. Getting it would happen after Jesus' ascension back into heaven, on you know, the day of Pentecost. Jesus' return to the Father was necessary in order to send the Holy Spirit, who would bring all the things Jesus had said and taught to mind with a new understanding, a renewed hope, really, in his promise that in another little while he would return yet again, one more time this time to set all things right. And so they have no idea right now as Jesus is saying this, uh, what real lamenting is. But in just a little while, they will. And that unspeakable sadness they're going to experience, the fear for their own lives and their unknown future would prepare them for the full impact of the resurrection. The, while the world rejoiced on Good Friday, the disciples wept helplessly. 
hopelessly. On that Saturday Sabbath after Good Friday and on Sunday morning, they fully expected that as Jesus' followers, they would be tracked down and killed themselves. Locked away in that upper room, they hiding out for fear of the Jews, they expected that at any minute that guards would, would break down the door and seize them. That would be their expected future from the time Jesus' lifeless body was taken down from the cross until he appeared to them after his resurrection. They felt nothing but unspeakable sadness until seeing him alive again turned their sadness into unspeakable joy. Luther compares their suffering with the sweat that he inflicted upon Adam when he banished him from the Garden of Eden. No longer would he just pick his dinner off a tree. No, he'd have to scratch the ground. He'd have to, to plant and grow and harvest his food. Now, you think he wasn't wishing he could get a do-over? For a little time, we will all experience suffering in this life. It can be unpleasant and hard and maybe even crushing. But we have to learn to bear it and bear up under it, not in our strength, but in God's. And in terms of eternity, it'll only be for a little while. After that, the end will come, and with it, the beginning of the, the greatest good and the resounding joy of a whole new life in a way better place, free from sin and sorrow. You know, a place where, like our lesson from Revelation says, God himself will wipe away every tear. Christ is the very Son of God. And through him, God demonstrated his power even over death itself. The resurrection is his proof and his promise that by faith, the grave will have no power to hold us either in just a little while. And while they're still standing, they're scratching their heads in confusion. Jesus offers his disciples an illustration. He's preparing them for the sorrow and then at the same time strengthening them in that sorrow. He relates his leaving and their suffering and his return and their rejoicing um, to a woman giving birth, pain and sorrow, and then unspeakable joy. Now the disciples were just beginning to feel the pain of Jesus' words and would actually, they'd actually feel it uh, acutely in just a little while when they experienced his, his crucifixion, his death. But they would soon see him alive again, like the joy of seeing a newborn baby. And their hearts would swell with joy, so much joy that no one could ever take it from them. That's what his death and resurrection would bring. It's what the Lord's death and resurrection still has the power to bring, even today. Now, we haven't seen Jesus with our own eyes like they did. We haven't walked with him and heard him teach and, and preach with our own ears like they did. We haven't witnessed his miracles with our own eyes like they did. That's why the Spirit needed to come, not only to open the spiritual eyes and ears and hearts of the disciples, who would carry those words and the promises they offered throughout the known world, but for us as well. We see Jesus today through the eyes of faith bestowed on us in the waters of holy baptism. We have the apostles' own accounting of his work and God's word. And through them, as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to to write their stories, their accounts. Jesus still speaks to us. You know, through the presence of his spirit in our hearts, he still walks with us. The fallen world we live in hasn't gotten any easier over the centuries. False religions continue to exist and even thrive. They may not be the same ones that were popular in Jesus' day, but they still teach a different gospel than the one Jesus taught. But while getting from here in this life to heaven with our Lord Jesus may take us through a very different world than the one his disciples knew. It's just as dangerous a world. You know, one that in some places may still demand the removal of our heads for our faith. But mostly it'll work in more subtle ways to remove our hearts from Christ with the promise of no waiting and no little whiles. Promises that you can have it all and that you can have it all right now in this life. That all you have to do is turn your back on Jesus' promise of a better future in a little while to his own promise of a better present. No waiting. All you have to do is give up that one thing you can't even see now. Faith in Jesus. The other thing in life that hasn't changed is that in a little while, death will come. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe in 10 or 20 years or 50 years. And on that day, you will see the living Christ face to face. Either to your condemnation or your unspeakable joy. Holding on to the promises, the very real presence of Christ will get you through the toughest times in this life. For however long your you know, little while might be. And through it all, God offers Jesus' resurrection as our sure promise of that life, the, 
that lies on just the other side. Jesus had to die so that you and I, sinners in every right, in the eyes of a holy, perfect God who hates sin, might be made acceptable to that same God who wants everyone to come to faith in his Son and be saved, redeemed by Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection for, from, for us, for slave, from slavery to sin. Don't let things you just don't get in this life get to you, okay, or get the better of you. God keeps his promises. In just a little while, all your sorrow will be turned to joy as you stand in the presence of our risen Lord, surrounded by all the faithful who are there now waiting to be reunited with you. It's true that the world might seem to, to take more than it gives at times. Uh, and when that happens, you just won't get it. But it can't take away the joy of knowing Jesus. In a little while, God promises to all who are his own. In just a little while, all our sorrow will be turned to joy. Amen. Now may that very special peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Let's take a moment to confess that uh, faith in our triune God. We'll do it in the words of the Nicene Creed on this Communion Sunday. Uh, why don't we stand as we do that? And you'll find it printed in your bulletins. Please join with me. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll take a moment now to receive your gifts, your tithes, and your offerings.
Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, in the glorious resurrection of your son, Jesus, you have given the promise of our own resurrection. As we await the last day, calm our hearts and strengthen our faith through our sorrows. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you have fashioned the church as a heavenly bride for your risen son. Grant her your spirit that she may always listen to his deathless voice and ever declare his message of salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, lead your people in your steadfast love and guide them in strength to your holy abode. Sanctify our homes, be the companion of those who live alone and make all our households places in which your wisdom and grace are found. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord, you hold all people accountable for the responsibilities you have given them. The Lord bless our president, our governor, the Congress and legislature, and all judges and magistrates. Guide them to serve according to your will and for the common good of all. Raise up those with heroic virtue who will defend our liberty. Protect those who defend us in the armed forces, even as you give peace to the nations. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Alpha and Omega, you pledge to bring all things to their perfect consummation. You will bring heaven to earth and banish sorrow, sin, and death. Sustain all those now in tribulation. By the comfort of your holy word, increase their faith and see them through their trials. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we wait for the second coming of your resurrected Son. Grant us patience as we long to see him. And even now, give us joy at his presence with us through the word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father. For the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and proper that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Because your loving kindness has reached to all peoples and nations in your time and in according to your plan. Grant that we may ever trust in the graciousness of your plan and the working of the Holy Spirit among us as we await the end of time and the fullness of eternity yet to be. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated.
rise for our closing uh, post communion canticle. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for having fed us with the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant us your grace, O Lord, that what we have received with our lips we may keep with pure hearts, and so may continue as true members of the body of Christ. May we truly treasure that which we have received, joyfully anticipating the divine fellowship of your eternal kingdom. This we ask through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his very, very special peace. Amen. Amen. We be seated for our closing hymn. <laughs> Great to see everybody this morning. Um, if you're on council, you meet Tuesday night this week. Uh, everything else, all the Bible studies, a lot of them are they're all still on. So try to connect with the Bible study. 
There's just only so much we can do from, you know, in a message. And uh, to pick it apart and, and dig into the text like we'd like to do, uh, like I get to do, preparing a message. Uh, it's something you have to do in Bible study. I know we have at least one birthday today, I think. It's Gail's birthday? Yeah, Gail Waddell. And uh, anybody else got a birthday today? Not an unbirthday. Got to be a dear birthday. <laughs> All right, let's sing to Gail. <laughs> Thank you for all you do right here, Gail, too, to help out. Anything else we need to announce before we break? Yes, David. Uh, Pastor Mike won't be here for Bible study, so unless there's somebody else who's conducting Bible study, no Bible study. <laughs> no, I don't think there is. He's still under the weather, yeah. So probably, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, there's no, uh, no Bible study following the service today. Sorry. Well, he'll catch you up, I'm sure, when he gets back next week. Uh, okay, listen, God bless your day. Enjoy God's creation, and uh, we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.